Yeah. Okay, I guess we'll get started. Welcome to the last in the trend series of uh, Society and Information Technology. Uh, there's a Friday seminar every week, but this is part of this special series um, that Gary and I sponsor. I want to, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Fernando Villegas and Martin Wattenbart. Uh, to campus. They are at Google. I'm going to have to read some things because there are some specifics here. Um, as you'll see in this talk, they are both technologists and artists. And in fact, they are the rock stars of information visualization. This is going to be fun. Uh, at Google, they had the Big Picture Data Visualization Group. That's a mouthful. And as you'll see, they create amazing visualizations to help people understand the mountains of data that are out there these days. Fernanda has a PhD from the Media Lab at MIT. Uh, Martin has a PhD in math from UC Berkeley, but Martin started out working in finance. He worked for Dow Jones and did data visualizations of the market, and Fernanda did visualizations of online communities. And then they joined together in a company first, and then at IBM. Is that right? Yeah. The other way around. Other way around. Okay. <laughs> they were at a company and IBM. We'll just keep the order out of it. Uh, before coming to Google, there they created the history flow. We have some visualizations framed now on the fifth floor. So in the reception, take a look at down there. You can see some of those. So history flow, are you used doing history flow? We are doing okay, history flow. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, this shows the authorship of activity in Wikipedia that inspired, inspired our own work in DocuVids, which shows the visualization of authorships in Google Docs. Their work hangs in the Museum of Modern Art. That's, that's rock star, right? That's my goal. I want to get something in MoMA. Uh, and, and some other museums as well. Uh, we have four of their prints now hanging in the halls on the fifth floor, so be sure to take a look at those. Please join me in welcoming Fernanda and Martin. Thank you. Thanks for the warm welcome, and thanks for the intro, Judy. It's very exciting to be here. Um, so we thought we would try to focus the talk a little bit around the notion of, of time. Uh, you're going to see a lot of projects today that deal with time, sometimes real-time data, sometimes historic data, um, and so different ways in which we have thought about that theme um, over time. And so to start with, I'm going to show you something that has nothing to do with time, but that is very telling of culture in general. So before we even joined Google, we were interested in things like, like these, uh, the sort of suggestions that Google give you when you start typing something, right? So I start typing something on, on Google, and then it gives me a list of suggestions. Why is it doing that? Any guesses? To save time. To save time, exactly, right? Because it's thinking, oh, when you say, why it doesn't, uh, I'm going to show you the most popular queries that people have asked Google with the same string, why it doesn't, okay? And so this is a way of just being efficient and saving you time, hopefully. But Martin and I take a look at that and we're like, oh, this is a window into people's you know, uh, um, collective psyche. And so what can we do that would visualize that kind of data? And so we did this piece, again, before we even joined the company, where we were using, where we decided to visualize the exact same data set. And we said, why doesn't she? Okay, and so what I'm doing <laughs> is I am visualizing the exact same list, but I'm starting to show things like the priorities. What are the things that are even more popular than other things? Um, and then the next fun thing I can do <coughs> is I can start to compare that query, that list of queries, against a different one, and I can say, why doesn't she versus why doesn't he. <laughs> and then you can start to get a sense of things that they share in common versus things where they are uh, different. Um, and this, obviously, let me see if I can go a little bit bigger. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so let me, and this is fun to play with, so I'm going to start typing other things. Like, is my daughter versus is my son. And the interesting thing here to me is that um, a lot of people think about data as sort of this cold thing, statistics, official statistics, government. 
And when I, when I look at a visualization like this, I think data can be very personal and can be very cultural. And when I look at things like these, I'm like, wow, there are things here that are funny. There are things that are sort of sad. There are things where you can start to see people being very vulnerable when they come to the web, right? Um, so let's do another one. Is my wife versus is my, my husband? Um, and again, um, you might be thinking, wow, everything is sort of depressing. Um, not what so much. to ask if their wife is beautiful to Google? I know. That's, that's really nice. I like that. Um, or we can say our cats versus our dogs. Exactly, right? You know what I'm going to ask here. But the, the cool thing is that you can also switch that around and be like, cats are versus <laughs> dogs are. And then you start to see that everything is awesome and the best and you know, cats are better than dogs and dogs are better than cats, of course. Um, but this is an interesting thing because when we started demoing this, this visualization, uh, we would see a certain set of, 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 of um, filling in the blanks and, and, and list of queries. And these tend to, to change over time. And so I'm going to go back to our theme of time here. So we'd like to talk about the first project that we worked on together. Um, and we were interested in understanding how Wikipedia works. And <coughs> I'm going to take you back in time to 2003. Wikipedia was very new back then. Here's a picture of what it looked like. You can see that kind of antique chrome on uh, the uh, Internet Explorer browser. And the thing that was amazing to everyone back then is that Wikipedia worked at all, that you could look up an article like this one on chocolate, and you get this very articulate, well-structured article. And the thinking then was that if everyone just collaborated, if you didn't have you know, Encyclopedia Britannica, Britannica's editors looking over your shoulder, it would just look like the walls of a gas station bathroom or something. Um, so we decided to, you know, to take a look at this, to study this. And the nice thing about Wikipedia is that they make all of their data available. So if you click on the bottom of a page, you get this list of all the past edits to every article. And it's not just the different versions, but you get some really nice metadata too. If you look here, you have the date of each edit, you have um, a username if the person has logged in, or an IP address if they haven't. You often even have a comment that the person says to tell you a little bit about what they meant. So we thought, OK, this is perfect. We have the data. We're going to start to explore. And we started reading multiple versions of a <coughs> bunch of articles. And then we stopped, because it just drives you crazy reading all of these essays that are almost the same, but not exactly. <laughs> and so we decided, all right, this is a problem. And we're going to solve it through visualization. So we came up with a method that we called history flow. And I'd like to explain a little bit schematically about how it works. So the idea is this, that suppose you have a document with multiple versions. We represent each version as a vertical line. The length of the line tells you the length of the document at that point. And then assuming there are multiple authors, we assign each author a random color, make them distinctive, and then uh, we color the line by who wrote which part of the document. So that's already kind of a useful thing, but it's also a little bit hard to kind of see what's going on. So we made one more change, and that is that when uh, parts of the document stay the same from one version to the next, we just connect them with a sort of solid parallelogram. And when you do that, you actually see a really nice clear pattern. So here, between version one and version two, you can see Suzanne added a little piece of text at the end. Between version two and version four, you can see Suzanne inserted a little bit piece of text at the beginning. And once we did that, patterns started to leap out. Now, we did a couple of other things as well. We made sure that, for example, you could space the versions by the time between them, as well as giving them equal space. And that you'd be able to uh, sort of zoom in on particular versions and read the actual text so we could see what was going on. So with that, we're going to go into a live demo. This whole talk is going to be full of live demos, just to give you that feeling of suspense that anything yeah, can happen. Yeah, kind of risk. <laughs> All right. So let me make this big. Uh, so this is history flow circa 2003. Okay, so this is like Wikipedia back in 2003. Um, and what you see here is the main diagram. Right now, we're visualizing the history of the edits on the article about design, okay? On the left is a list of all the people who have touched this article. On the right is the article itself, 
So the text of the article colored by the different authors who wrote different chunks of, of the text. Um, I have a wand here that I can use to go back, to move around uh, in the diagram. And if I you know, just move that wand back and forth, I can see how the article changes over time. Okay, so this is design on Wikipedia. Now let's, let's look at the article on cat. So as we all know, people care a lot more about cats than they do about design um, on the internet. I know that because the article is a lot longer. It has a bunch, bunch more versions. There's a lot more people who have touched this article. And then there's some interesting um, patterns that I started seeing here in the diagram. One of them is this kind of stripy pattern here at the top. Um, and if I bring my wand over here to the beginning of this pattern, <coughs> what I see is that someone added a table of the scientific classification for cats, okay? So they have the kingdom, the class, the order, the family, the species uh, for cats. All very good. Um, then I see different patterns that might be of interest as well. One is this kind of pointer here, this antenna at the bottom sticking out and not being connected to anything else. And so when I come over here to investigate what this is, I see that someone added a bunch of white paragraphs here, paragraphs in white, that have to do with the Unix command cat. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So you have a page about cats, the animal, and someone added at the end a bunch of text about a computer command. Uh, so what happens? It's not linked to anything. On the next version, it's not there. So what happened? Did someone just come and delete the whole thing? Well, if I investigate, what I see is that someone didn't just delete the whole thing. They, in fact, redirected the content to a new page called Cat Unix. Okay. And this was exactly the kind of collaboration pattern that we were trying to understand by visualizing Wikipedia. It was sort of like, oh, how do people um, you know, figure out what belongs or doesn't belong in a page? How do you separate content from one another? And so it was interesting to start seeing um, these dynamics. I'm going to turn to a different page now. The history of the article on abortion. <clears throat> it's a very long article. It's very intricate. It has, again, a bunch of people who touched this article. But I'm curious, does anything, anyone see anything strange or different? It yeah. looks like someone just completely deleted the article. Oh, okay. <laughs> Punchline. So you're saying, and what where are the pieces that you're seeing this? Just big gaps. Big it. gaps, right? The big gaps, exactly. And I don't even have to ask because he already said it looks like someone deleted the entire article. And that's exactly what happened in those two big gaps. And so if I come over here, I have this really nice long article and then boom, it's gone. If I go over here, not only did they delete, but they said abortion is great. And then they said abortion is good. And then it got reverted. Okay. so. We started seeing these, and we were very interested in, one, how things were getting reverted, but also how fast. If I look at when this piece of vandalism, when, when this act of vandal vandalism happened, this it's called mass deletion. I have a timestamp at the bottom here. You can't read it, but I'll read it for you. It's, uh, this happened on the 17th of December at 4.06, okay? It got fixed on the same day at 4.07. So it took a minute for this to get fixed. And we started seeing this over and over again, that within minutes, these things would get fixed. We're like, how, how are they doing this? And so we got in touch with Wikipedians and asked, how do you deal with mass deletions? And what they explained to us is that there was a thing called a watch list on Wikipedia. And the way it worked is if you edited anything on Wikipedia, and I guess cared enough about it, you could add any article, any page, to your watch list. Whenever that page got edited, you would get a notification that it got changed. And then the other strategy that Wikipedians would use is if I get a notification and I recognize the name of the person who made that edit, and I know and trust them uh, to be good Wikipedia citizens, I don't even bother looking at it. 
But if the if the edit comes from an anonymous IP address or some username I had never seen before, then I'm going to check and make sure that this is not um, a, a, you know bad behavior. And so this was one of the one of the ways in which we, they were getting close tabs on uh, on what was happening in the pages. In fact, these things were happening so fast that right now we're visualizing them by number of versions. But if I visualize the same data in terms of rhythm, in terms of real time, I, I never see these gaps. They are so fast, they're, they're fixed so fast, that they're gone. OK. <clears throat> and then I'm going to switch to my favorite example, which is chocolate. Martin and I are chocoholics, so we had to visualize this page. And it was very pink, but nothing too exciting. Except that, I'm visual, again, I'm visualizing it by real time. So now let's visualize it by versions. And what stands out, stands out to you? A revision war. A revision war. The zigzag, yeah. right? Exactly. I saw the zigzag, and I'm like, this is beautiful. I want a scarf that looks like this, or a dress that looks like this. Um, but it's an edit war. And I can show you where it starts. So. Back here, uh, this guy at the top, I don't know if you can read it, Daniel C. Boyer, adds this small paragraph in white um, that reads, extremely rarely, melted chocolate has been used to make a kind of surrealist sculpture called coulage. Okay, so this paragraph survives for this long. You can see the white streak here. And then, over here, someone says, removing Boyer invention. Well, he comes back and says, Reverting, collage is not a Boyer invention. The person says, Google search for chocolate collage, finds only Boyer. It comes back, reverting. The other person, leave your humbug out. Reverting, and so forth. Until Daniel C. Boyer gets really tired and leaves. Um, that's unfortunate because Martin and I did a search on Google and chocolate collage does exist. It's a thing, but such is life on Wikipedia. You don't win every, every war. So um, again, the visualization was showing us um, you know, these kinds of, of dynamics that Wikipedians were certainly aware of, but it was the first time that you could actually see um, at scale. Another thing we did with this visualization is we had versions that just didn't color anything by author. Um, so I'm going to take away all the author encoding here. And now what we did is we just colored the text by how, how old it is. So the, the darker a piece of text is, and I'm going to scroll down so you can see here on the right that there are dark pieces of text. Um, the, the darker a piece of text is, the older it is. Why do I care about that? Well, I care about that because in an environment like Wikipedia, a piece of text that survives in text, intact could be used as a proxy for quality, right? If you have a bunch of eyeballs and nobody has bothered to change your text, it probably means it's, it's pretty good. And one of the things that we saw um, was that, indeed, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of text in, in, in articles that sort of tends to stabilize over time. So now, let me try to go back. Oh, and the other thing I want to say, shout out for DocuViz. So I was really, we were really excited um, when we realized that Judy and Gary and the students here were creating DocuViz because it, it's basically, it's a Chrome extension that allows you to use uh, something very close to the history flow visualization you saw for your own documents and when you collaborate with folks. And so this took the visualization sort of out of the lab and put it in the real world. So I'm very excited about this work. So just wanted to give a shout out there. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, OK, so that gives you an example of taking text and sort of visualizing that, which is an interesting thing, as Fernanda said. It's more than just looking at numbers, but you're taking things that aren't necessarily thought of as data, you know, articles on Wikipedia, applying some processing, and getting a, vi getting a visualization. We can take it even further, and we want to show you an example of uh, using, of uh, visualizing images um, in the, the same sort of way. 
So this actually came from an art piece that we were asked to do by a Boston magazine. They wanted a visualization of the seasons in Boston. And we thought about the seasons, um, and we thought specifically about you know, nice places in Boston, um, like the Boston Common, sort of the central park of Boston. You see a bunch of pictures here. We looked at these pictures and we felt, okay, there's something about these pictures. I mean, to a human, they clearly capture the seasons. Is there something we could do to visualize the ebb and flow? And we realized probably just looking at the colors, we could get at uh, seasonal variation in an interesting way. And I'm going to walk you through um, both sort of the algorithm we used, and then I'll show you the result. So the idea is that very simple. We said, okay, we're going to take a histogram of colors of these images. We'll take the color cube, divide it into little buckets, as you see here, um, you know, sort of a discrete set of buckets. And then we're just going to count um, for each season of the year, or each month, we'll look at all the pictures that were taken in that month in a, you know, a sample from Flickr. <coughs> Um, and create a histogram of how common different colors were. So the image on the right is essentially showing you a histogram of the color cube where the bigger cubes are sort of showing you more instances of that particular color. And then we figured we will plot that over time. And I want to take you through that. Let's see. So we're just going to load this up here. There's a whole bunch of images. As we said, this is all about the live demo. Suspense. Will it crash? It could. No. OK. So here's the final image. Um, what you're seeing here is a <coughs> ring. The ring goes around the year season. So winter is at the bottom. It goes up through spring here to summer, over to fall. And as I mouse over this, I can see the individual images that were used to create this visualization. And as you would hope, you actually can see the seasons very directly. Down here, winter in Massachusetts, it's very, very gray. Um, over here, though, in spring, you start to see this bright streak of scarlet. And that tells you that flowers are blooming in the common. Then you get you know, beautiful green by June. You know, leaves are everywhere. Then we get, I guess, some summer bad weather here. It looks like a lot of gray skies. And then as we go into October, we get the foliage. You can see this lovely area here where there's all these sort of fall leaves. And then, sadly, it's back to November. Um, so this is sort of a, a nice way. It's not telling you anything you didn't know. This is not an analytical visualization in any sense. Um, but it is giving you sort of a feel for Boston. I mean, for those of you who live in Southern California, you can sort of get a sense of that depressing summer trough this way. Uh, and so it's, it's a, you know, not a cultural visualization, but a kind of social visualization that I think shows how you can use something that you don't normally think of as data to create. Uh, I was just going to say, if you were wondering what's happening on the side here as Martin is interacting with this, these are the, the names, usernames, right? Yeah, of those are the Flickr credits for those yeah, images. Yeah, for those images. So that's, that's the list of, of, that you see coming in and out of, of focus there. So yeah, there's the full circle. You can see this actually um, in this building. There's a print. Um, here's a close-up of the seasons. You can see how different they are when you really zoom in on them. Um, and here's how it looked in the final magazine. Cool. All right, so then we're going to switch now to real-time data. Um, a, a, a couple years ago, maybe more, um, YouTube came to us. We were already at Google. YouTube came to us and uh, with a question, which was, can, can visualization help our users understand uh, what videos are going viral in different parts of the US and how they change every day? And we're like, yes, visualization can help, we think. So we decided to create a map of viral videos on YouTube in real time. And so let me show you what that looks like. And this is the YouTube Trends map. So this is very straightforward. It's a very straightforward kind of visualization where we're using a map of the US. And then we're plotting little icons for each one of the regions in the US. And we're showing the top viral video. So the little icons you see here are the thumbnails of the videos themselves. So you know, on this, on this region here, um, 
if I, I just mouse mouse over, uh, you can see this is the Black Ops 3 Zombies is the top viral video there. Um, so it's a video game video. Um, over here, this is a music video um, that's trending at this point. This is, oh, over here in Alaska, it's all about the Magnificent Seven. Um, so you get a sense of what different regions are looking at. Um, you can also do the opposite, and this is the video list. And if I mouse over the video list itself, it shows me, it highlights to me just um, that video on the map and, and so forth. So you can see where, you know, the rest of the places in the country where the Mag Magnificent Seven or Rihanna are, are trending. And there are a couple of interesting things here. Sometimes you, you get trends that are very local, like this one, for instance. I guess people in the Northeast and some people in the South really like this, this video right now. Um, sometimes you get patterns where you have a single video sweep the entire nation. And sometimes you get patterns that depend on demographics. So this is what the entire, this is what's trending overall right now. And again, this map changes. Um, but if I look at just females, it's a very different picture, right? And so the top thing for females is the Disney Princess Pool Party. Um, and so except for the second video here that is all about calling in sick to places you don't work. Um, so, you know, go figure. Um, if I go back and I start looking at different <coughs> ages, so older folks, 65 and, and plus, they have a very different palette of videos they are looking at. I guess the first one is transgender in a women's bathroom, a social experiment. Um, but then you get this other one that I thought was interesting, which is a, a lo sort of a, a local uh, pattern going on here about Yellowstone. Um, and if I go back in the age scale a little bit to, you know, 35 to 44 years old, it's all about, did you ever see my tail? And no songs. You know, like, who, I mean, can't make up this stuff. So, um, and, and again, and, and, you know, if I start to scroll down, you start to see different break, break up, break up by, um, by demographics, by different demographics. Uh, let me scroll back. Now I want to show you some historical screenshots. So this was um, uh, over a year ago when on the same day males <coughs> were watching the, um, uh, the preview for the movie Men of Steel. And on the same day, females were all watching the Dove Real Beauty um, commercial. Anyone? Has anyone seen? Dove? Yes? Yeah. Yes. See? See? Women! Yes! I, I watched the video and I was like, oh my god, I'm part of the demographics. This is so true! Um, so it was, it's like that. And then um, days like this where the pattern is very sort of north versus south. On the north there was an activist video about um, distributing clothes, brand name clothes to homeless people. And in the south, it's this video here about a man, a hunting man, catching a bird with his bare hands. Um, make of that what you will. Um, and then there are days when, as I was saying, a single video sort of sweeps the nation. This was um, a fashion brand um, from LA, um, and the video was First Kiss. Does anyone, does that? Sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, strangers coming together for the first time and kissing. Yes, I'm getting nods. Yes, you see, we're part of the country. It's true. Um, and then this, my favorite one, grandma's smoking weed for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, you can't make this up. This is like sweeping the nation. Um, one of the things that was interesting while we were starting this project is a couple of things. One is we were really afraid that we would only get cat videos all the time. <laughs> we don't. Cat videos almost never make it to the top. The other thing I'll say is that um, by doing this visualization, uh, we were actually helping YouTube clean up their data pipe uh, pipeline. Um, and again, this is one of the things that visualizations are really good at. 
is showing you when you have data that's not super good. And so this was this was one case, and the visualization helped. What do you mean by that? Do what do I mean by that? I what I mean is that people on YouTube buy viewership, so. <laughs> To make sure that your video seems like it has a ton of views, you can buy views. I mean, and it's illegitimate. You don't. It's like you buy it from nefarious characters online. Yeah, it's something you shouldn't um, be doing. Yeah. It's if it's not clear, yeah. you shouldn't be doing that. But people do. It's it's ad advertised on the web anywhere. And so one of the things that YouTube works really hard to do is to understand the difference between real view viewership and fake viewership. So it's equivalent to Google's SEO. Search engine optimization kind of combat that. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So <coughs> one of the things we noticed with the trends map actually is that because it was live, when we would show it to people, it often sort of had this power to like they would recognize particular videos, and it it clearly had a certain emotional punch to it, like in a funny way. Um, more so, I think, than some of the more historical visualizations we've done that would show, you know change in, in, in the distant past. And I think that's a theme that, that we're starting to notice, is that the more your data is real time, the more it can kind of connect and engage you at an emotional level. And it's all sorts of emotions. So the one, the visualization I want to show next is uh, something that I think is very scary, in fact. So this is a visualization called the digital attack map. And let me explain a little bit about what it's showing. Um, it's displaying something called a distributed denial of service attack. So I think some of you know this, um, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about it because a lot of this was actually new to me. The slide you see here is a really oversimplified timeline, but it, it don't take it as the literal truth, but it shows the general course of events. So there are many kinds of cyber attacks. Um, you know, you could try to hack into a computer or you know, turn it off or something. But the absolute simplest thing you can do is what's called a denial of service attack, where you simply overwhelm a computer with many, many requests, meaning that it can't even respond to you anymore. And more importantly, it can't respond to legitimate requests anymore. And it's a distributed denial of service attack if you enlist many, many computers across the globe in sort of attacking one server somewhere. And these things are, are you know, they started out as kind of a funny thing people would try initially. Eventually, uh, criminals got involved. They would actually try to extort monies, money from, say, an online store. They'll be like, we're taking your store down, and if you don't pay us, it's going to stay down. And you know, it's a very sort of classic extortion scheme. Uh, what is a little bit frightening is that governments have gotten involved as well, that this is a way of suppressing media sites, for instance, that is, in some ways, um, much cleaner from the government's point of view than actually sending physical people in to shut down a site. You can just do it by computer. So we worked with a group at Google, now called Jigsaw, it used to be called Google Ideas. That's kind of a think tank, or as they say, do tank as well. Um, and an outside partner called Arbor Networks that had uh, data on these attacks to create a map. Um, and I want to show you this map right now of live attacks happening. Alright, it's going to take a little while to load in because it's actually a frightening amount of data. We have both uh, current and historical data. So this is the state of the world right now. Uh, and you can see there's a bunch of large attacks happening. Now, I should say this is just 2% of the attacks that we're getting, it's the top 2%. And the way to read this is that when you see an arc like this, you're seeing uh, computers in one country attacking computers in another country. We have to be careful about how we talk and think about this because it's not necessarily true that that country is attacking the computers. It could be that someone else entirely is controlling the, the computers. Um, here we see a whole bunch of attacks raining down on Saudi Arabia. We don't know the source, which is why they're <coughs> kind of coming from the sky. And in Brazil, computers are attacking some other uh, country. And just to give you a sense of the sweep, I'm going to start this off historically and play some of the past days. And you can see that there's just a constant fight going on. There's a struggle between computers and other computers. Um, in the US, you can see this sort of circular pattern. That means that computers in the US are attacking other computers in the US. Um, and what is very interesting is it turns out that if you follow news, you can quite often correlate these attacks with events happening. You know, there will be 
protests in Thailand, something happening in Hong Kong, and you will see these denial of surface attacks happening in concert with sort of political events or other events. Other things are utterly mysterious, and it just makes you wonder. Like, there's no trace of why, you know, suddenly there's a huge thing going on in the Middle East, and you realize there's sort of secret actions taking place everywhere. Um, so this is, I think, an interesting case of a visualization that is showing you what is going on below the surface. Um, and the fact that it's happening in real time, that we're seeing what's going on right today, to me, gives it this sort of emotional punch that is quite dramatic. Um, Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Can it detect attacks against itself? That's a good question. Um, so it's funny, probably quite likely it could. Um, I, I, that's a, this is a complicated question you're asking. Um, I think it's conceivable that it could detect those in some ways. Because of the way we're displaying the data and processing it, we're, we're not, we don't get the fine-grained enough data to know that it itself is being attacked. Um, but it's po if someone launched a major attack against it, it's quite possible it would show up in some form on this, I believe. Um, you, know, you can see a bunch of uh, you know, the kinds of attacks that show up on here end up, you, know, you can see in the news, you know, extortion here. Uh, you can see political events. Uh, and I would encourage you to sort of go play with this. Watch it change every day, because it's sort of a weather map of bad things happening. <laughs> and, and one of the things to keep in mind, when we were uh, creating this visualization, sort of a, a, a big portion of our target audience were journalists. And the reason for that is that this kind of crime is so hard to talk about because it's highly technical, it's highly opaque, nobody sees it happening, right? Um, that journalists have a real hard time being able to make it concrete enough for people to care about. Um, and so having a visualization that is it's out there, it's real time, they can point to and say, look, you know, whatever country is being just piled upon today um, is, really, is really important. When we were designing the visualization, we made sure that not only did you have that you know, sort of page as, as a, as a uh, destination, but you could also embed the visualization in a much smaller version live on your website um, as a way of, of um, adding it to the news. And that has been quite successful. Oh yeah, and so an example is, is this here. Um, just to give you a sense of how journalists have been incorporating this kind of real-time visualization. Yes? Can you zoom in and find your own location? You can zoom in and find a country. So on purpose, this, this data is so aggregate that it's only at a country level. So even if you zoom into the US, it doesn't mean that you will be able to see, oh, what's happening in LA or what's happening in Boston. You can't, it's just US, France, you know, <coughs> sorry, that's the, that's the granularity. Um, okay. So, um, continuing with the theme of real time data, of sort of things that are happening at a global <coughs> scale, and giving people an understanding. Of, of things that might be hard to get from your little neck of the woods. We worked with, uh, what I'm about to show is, is another project we did with the Google Ideas slash Jigsaw folks. And this is what it is about. It's about visualizing news coverage worldwide. And I'll show you a little bit about the inspiration, the motivation for this kind of, for, for the kind of project we did. So I'm from Brazil, and I care a lot about what happens in Brazil. And not sure how many of you have been following this, but the president of Brazil is in deep, deep trouble, and about to be impeached. And it's huge scandal. It is crazy. The entire country is like stopping and trying to impeach. I guess not the entire country, but anyway. <laughs> it's like, you know, we've never seen this situation before in Brazil. So this is like huge news, right? This is the, this is the front page of the most important uh, newspaper in Brazil on March 17th of this year. Okay, millions of people on the streets, blah, blah, blah. This is the New York Times on the same day. And this is where they talked about Brazil. Okay, 
Brazilian crisis deepens. That's what they said. At the same time, they were talking about how Clinton wrecks up, wins, and a groups resist white men. White, 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 what white men thinks, think about Hillary Clinton and her looks and so forth. So, you know, priorities and priorities, that's what it's all about in the news. Um, but this, to me, illustrates exactly the kind of, of scenario we were trying to, to address with the visualization, which is when you were in the, you know, you were exposed to a series of media outlets in whatever country you live in, and that media will choose to cover certain things, right? And probably not cover other things that might be really important in the rest of the world. So sort of your news bubble, if you will, right? So what is our news bubble here in the US? And how is that different from, say, the news bubble in Italy? or in China, or in Brazil, right? And so this is what this visualization is going to try to address. So let me get there. Uh, and the visualization is called Unfiltered News. That's and the so actual URL. Yes, unfiltered.news. And so what it does is it, it um, uploads the top topics that are being covered right now all over the world. This is sort of a map of the world. Each bubble, each circle is a country. And um, if I zoom in, and, and different, and bubbles are colored by continent, okay? So we are right here in the US. I'm gonna start zooming into the US. And as I zoom in, you can start to read some of the top topics that are being covered today in the news here. Um, here in the US. Uh, if I move around, you know, this is what's happening in Mexico, for instance. Uh, this is what's happening in Brazil. All right. Uh, and, and so forth. So you can move around the globe. We can go to <coughs> China, you know, and see what they seem to care about today. You don't speak Chinese? Sorry? You don't get Chinese news? Oh, yeah. So this is a good question. So. Because it knows I'm in the US, it shows me everything in English. If I were in China, it would be showing me things in Chinese. If I were in Brazil. But these are translations just, of yes. that news that is in Chinese. Yeah. OK. And then the other thing is, since it knows I'm in the US, it's pulsating this bubble here. And um, it's saying, yes, you were there. This is, this is what you care about. It's also telling me, Topics less reported in the United States, okay? So there's a whole list of things here that are being talked about elsewhere in the world today that the U.S. is not talking about as much. So for instance, Ukraine. Yeah, the U.S. is a little dot here. And Russia and Ukraine care a lot about Ukraine, but so does a lot of Europe. Uh, and we're not seeing that in the U.S., yes? Where is it getting all this data? Yeah, so we're getting this data from Google News, okay? And um, one of the things that we're doing, oh, yeah, let me show you some other things before I forget. Um, let's do some searches. So let's, let's search for certain things that I know we're talking about a lot in the US, and I wanna see how the rest of the world compares. So for instance, Trump, Donald Trump, okay. So this is how the world looks right now for, for Trump. Um, so a lot of interest in Asia. China not saying much at all about Trump. Uh, but Asia and Europe, Brazil is not saying anything about Trump. Um, <laughs> let's look, let's compare that to Hillary. Um, less interest. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. But not only that, let me go back to Trump for a moment um, and show you another thing. It's kind of interesting. So when I do a search and it's starting to show me all the countries that are talking about that topic, it also here shows to me a couple of things. One is the is sort of the popularity of this topic over time. So this is this timeline. And I can sort of go, go back and be like, oh, Trump was really hot over here. What was going on? And this was March 12th, and this is what the world looked like in terms of Trump coverage. I'm gonna go back to today, and then I'm going to start scrolling down through headlines that come from different countries, right? So this is what's happening in terms of Trump in the US and Canada. 
in Mexico. And again, I can click on these and go to the actual article. Okay. Uh, these are, again, um, translations, automatic translations of the headlines. If I don't, and I'm sort of, I auto translate here, I can say turn that off and give me the headlines in their own language. Okay. Because um, that's how I like it. Um, so it gives you a way of looking at, at the world very, very um, quickly. Let me just do one more thing. The Zika virus, um, and you can see what countries care about that today and how it changed over time. Uh, so again, this is a filtered news and available on the web. And yeah, and I think it's a, a great example also of a live visualization carrying sort of an emotional punch. So we want to end um, very quickly with a, a description of an art project where once again we try to use live visualization to create a kind of emotional reaction in, in the viewer. And this is something that started uh, in a Cambridge winter when Fernanda and I were talking about the cold, cold wind that was blowing that day. And we started to wonder, like, what does the wind look like? Could we visualize it? Um, you know, I was certain it simply blew west to east because of the Earth's motion. Fernando was a little bit skeptical of that. Um, and so we decided to settle this through visualization. And I'm actually going to take you through a little bit of live coding to show you how we tried to do this. So we began by finding data for the wind across the world. And we plotted it in a really, really basic way, just to make sure we had it correct. Um, and to put green vectors on a black background just to make sure we knew this wasn't the final piece. And in fact, you can sort of see what the wind looks like a little bit here. You can even maybe make out outlines of continents um, if you look closely. Okay, so we had parsed the data. That was fine. Next, we needed to visualize it in an elegant way. So the thing is that we actually had a really good, what can't miss way to do this. And that was, we were like, okay, what is wind? It's just little particles moving around. What we'll do is draw little particles moving according to the direction of wind at each point, and that's going to be both a clear and beautiful view of what's going on in the world. So <laughs> it didn't quite work out how we hoped. Um, you know, we we're like, well, maybe that data is just bad. We're going to um, you know, use US data. Maybe that's better. Not a whole lot better. Not very good. So that, that was OK. You know, we were used to setbacks. Um, and we had another idea. We're like, okay, what we'll do is we'll continue with this idea of flow, and we'll imagine dropping paint across the US and letting it sort of flow around according to the wind. And when we did that, well, this is what we got. So, you know, I was at Berkeley, I've heard about melting colors. Um, it's an interesting to look at for a little bit, but I think we can agree it's not really giving you a very useful portrait of, of the wind at all. Okay, so we had another idea. This idea was to imagine taking a paintbrush, um, you know, black paint, white paint, and following the contours that the wind kind of defined. And I'd like to show that to you now, unless you're epileptic, in which case, please close your eyes. Uh, and when we did that, we got this kind of flashing monstrosity. But it's actually a little bit more interesting than the previous ones. It certainly tells you more than all those moving dots did. You can see the wind is moving either north to south or south to north in the center of the country. So Fernanda has proven correct and, and I was proven wrong. But it's also um, obviously kind of a mess in other ways. Like you can't tell whether the wind is going up or down um, in, in the center of the country. So we thought about this and we realized that actually the very first thing we tried had been quite close, that there was a small modification we could make using this as sort of inspiration that would help us create an animated view of the wind. And I'm actually just going to code this for you right now, um, partly to show the value of working in code. So as you know, the way a computer animates stuff is it will draw something off screen, it will put it on screen, it will then for the next frame erase what it drew, draw a new thing, put that on screen, and so forth. Um, and in fact, you can actually see that whole erasure happening in these two lines. Um, but what if I don't erase it? completely on each frame. What if I just erase it a little bit and still have those moving around dots? In that case, what I'll get is something like this, where I see trails left. And suddenly, what before was an incomprehensible mess actually is starting to give you pretty useful information. 
So this is still kind of ugly and rough, but we can see that we're basically almost there. And in fact, with just a little bit more editing, we ended up with what you see here. Because this is actually what the wind is doing today. I'm going to zoom in. <coughs> look in this area. Yeah, it's definitely blowing off of the Pacific. It's actually pretty strong. Uh, I can unzoom. Uh, yeah, I can make it a little bit bigger there. Um, and th this becomes actually something that's very beautiful and hypnotic. Like I'm getting distracted now, even talking with you. I just want to zoom and zoom and zoom. But it also ha packs, you know, sort of an interesting punch. Like it's fun just to look at all the different days. We created this gallery of of, to show all the ways it had looked in the past. Um, in fact, this is an important pattern we've discovered with live visualizations, is showing the past for context is critical. This is a day where we got emails from people saying, hey, Canada is stealing all of our air. Um, <laughs> on, on a sort of darker note, um, we discovered that when hurricanes happened, it was genuinely frightening. I mean, it was frightening for us if they were coming anywhere near us, and we would get email from people um, basically saying, I'm sitting here just watching this hurricane make landfall, and I'm praying that nothing too bad happens. Uh, so once again, I think that's the <laughs> emotional power of a live visualization. So <clears throat> a quick note on technique. The truth is that the wind has been visualized for hundreds of years, right? And it, it used to look something like this, a static image, a lot of times a vector field where you aggregate the data as much as you can and you draw these arrows. Um, by visualizing the same data in a way that aggregates the data a lot less and shows a lot more the details and the complexity, you end up with something that I would claim is easier to read, even though it's unintuitive. It's a more complicated image, it's more texture, it's more, it has more detail. But I would say it's easier to make out the patterns that are happening there. One of the things that was interesting to, to see was the effect and sort of the reaction to this piece. This was an art piece we did for ourselves. We put it on the web. We didn't think it was going to be a big deal. It turned out to be a, a pretty big deal. Um, so today, when you look at weather forecast across the world, people are using this same kind of techniques, right, that didn't exist before. Um, and so that's kind of cool to see that professional meteorologists are using the technique that you created for art. Um, but the other thing is that we started getting a lot of emails, a ton of emails to our inbox. Um, and so we would get emails from, say, farmers who look at the map before they decide when to spray their crops. Um, we started getting emails from scientists um, who look at bird migration, butterfly migrations. Um, teachers who love to sit with their students in front of the computer and try to understand, oh, is this a crazy week where we're going to get tornadoes? Um, pilots. We started getting emails from pilots, both commercial pilots and military pilots, saying that they <coughs> look at the wind map before they fly, and we're like, no, please do not do that. This is an art piece. We make no claims. In fact, we started getting so many of these very sort of like, I use your map to do X, and X is very important, that we decided we needed a disclaimer. So we put a disclaimer on the website where we said, please do not use the map or its data to fly a plane, sail a boat, or fight wildfires, because we got multiple emails about all of those things. Um, and then we started getting emails that said, yeah, I get your disclaimer, but please respect the power of this visualization. Um, and so this is a really interesting moment in where you, you realize that having real data visualized on the web has, it's, can be very powerful. And people will appropriate these visualizations in ways you may not have expected, um, which I think is extremely exciting and you know, makes you think what kinds of roles visualization could play. Thanks. So we'll end there, and we'd love to take questions about live visualization.
Yeah, no, just time for a couple of questions. I want you to stand and shout because we only have two mics, and I don't want to take it away from either one of them. And I'll just say we have a slide with all the references here. Okay. Where do you get your wind data from? So the uh, government actually makes it available. Um, if, if you go to the site, you'll see we have a link to the actual thing. It's, it's sort of a um, very, very short term, like one to three hour um, forecast, essentially. From uh, NOAA. From NOAA, yeah. yeah. No. So, but it's, okay. it's amazing that this is available for free. Like, I think this is our tax dollars at work. I think we should all just appreciate how wonderful it is that this is out there. Thanks, uh, Matt Beats. Uh, this was a great talk, and these are beautiful visualizations. And I, I like where you ended, because it actually gets to a question that I was thinking about a little bit. Um, I want to probe a little bit more why you think the disclaimer is necessary. Is it simply that you don't want the liability? Is it that you think that the data, that something about the doing that visualization hides biases or problems in the data, data? Or is it that you think that the visualization can actually, in some ways, perhaps produce inappropriate conclusions? The, the visualization, um, a key part of it is running off of a computer in my study. Um, and if we have a power failure, you know, who knows? I, it basically, I think it's not, you know, in some ways, I think that disclaimer is just a way of letting people know this is not an industrial strength search. This is not a Google product, to be clear. This is an art project that we created. Um, so it's, I, don't, I think it's much less a matter of bias than just this is not something that we see as an industrial well, strength search. But could you address the sort of deeper questions, though, about, uh, about yeah. what is that relationship yeah, between about the how you get from data to conclusion yeah. through visualization? So in this case, so, so one thing that I think we, we think about and talk about in terms of visualization, any kind of visualization, I think it's really important for you to be very explicit about what your source data is, where it's coming from, what kind of data it is, uh, how reliable it is, right? In this case, we're getting government data. Um, but every visualization also has a limitation, right? If we were building this visualization for pilots, we would be doing things that are very different. Uh, for instance, one of the things that we're very clear on our website is that we're visualizing surface data, surface wind, right, which goes up to 10 meters. That's not where you're going to use if you're a pilot, right? And we are very clear about that. And, and so this is um, a constant debate in the visualization community, which is how do you make sure that you explain your source that you explain the limitations of a visualization. And even when you do, sometimes people don't read it, right? Um, so there's all of that that comes into play. There are also a lot of design decisions we made here that um, don't make for the most utilitarian of maps. So for instance, we're not demarcating state boundaries, right? We're not labeling everything. In fact, we're labeling very little here. We're not saying what the terrain is underneath any of this, right? If we were building a utilitarian map, we would be doing things very differently. All of that is not to say that I don't like the fact that communi different communities are making use of this map. I think it's wonderful. Um, I just want those communities to be aware of the limitations. Makes sense. One more question. Yes. Um, are there particular frameworks or programming environments that you tend to use that you favor in building visualizations? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one framework that's very popular right now is D3 for doing web-based visualizations. And the thing I'll say there is that it's an incredibly powerful framework that I believe is people don't tend to use its full power. Um, I see so many people going and basically taking a wonderful example that they find because the creators of D3 put amazing examples online. And they'll just tweak them, which is a good way to learn. But they'll stop there. And I think the advice I would give is to pick one framework, like D3, or pick some other framework. Learn it deeply enough that you no longer have to tweak other people's examples. Because um, as uh, John Maida has said, it's, if you're using other people's tools, to some extent, you're living in their dream. Um, and I think many people are living in the D3 dream, but you don't have to. Part of the beauty of D3 is that it's so flexible, you can dream your own dreams with it. That's a good place to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.